Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to the chapel. My name's Paul. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. It's great to be worshiping with you this morning. Glad to be in this room with you. Glad that everyone can join us online. Hope that you're having a great first week of summer. I hope that your air conditioners are working today. Feels like it's going to be very warm out there. Speaking about summer, we're continuing our series on Exodus, titled From Here to There, just and, and exploring how God knows that some of our tendencies in our life and some of the things that we do kind, kind of lead us into bondage, into difficult situations. And because God loves us so much, he is not content to just leave us in those difficult places, but he always moves us from here to there, moving towards him and growing in our relationship with him. And the thing about that is, which is good and bad at the same time, is that God never just picks us up and plops us somewhere new. It's never just a quick thing. But God always moves us and, and, and walks with us through the middle of these difficult transitions and, and kind of carries us through and fosters and grows the relationship that we have with him in the middle of those things. So that's what we're going to continue to talk about today. And today we're going to be talking about the idea of doubt and more, more specifically the concept of doubting God. And doubt is one of those tricky things, right? Right? Doubt is something that loves to be alone with us. Doubt loves to whisper to us. It whispers things like, you are the only one who doubts me. Doubt loves to to find itself in our time when we're about to fall asleep, in moments of silence in our lives. And it's always really there. And the, the saying that, you know, even if we're having a great day and things are going well, doubt sometimes creeps in and kind of casts a shadow over what we're thinking and the plans that we have. If you follow Christ, sometimes doubt doesn't show up on Sunday mornings, but on Monday morning, it's right back there with us. It hits us Mondays, it hits us in times of isolation, and it comes when we're trying to sleep or in the rare moments of silence we have. As church people, and and sometimes at church, if you come to church, we don't really talk about doubting God that much out in the open. How many times have you been in the atrium or out there walking in and you ask your friend how they're doing? And they say, well, I'm doubting God's goodness to me today. How are you? (laughs) No, we don't really do that. We usually just say, fine, and we carry on. It's like somehow if we admit that we're doubting God, we feel less than. We feel like not a faithful person. And doubt's one of those things that we feel ashamed about for even thinking about. Worst of all, apart from doubt hurting us personally and hurting us within our communities, Many of us believe, if we're honest, that our doubt, or God looks down upon us when we doubt him, that God is actually repelled by our doubt. But do you think that's true? I mean, if we look at that, is that really true? How can we even, how can doubt, how can faith or trust even exist without doubt? Just like bravery can't exist without fear. These two things go hand in hand. God is not repelled by our doubt. And we can trust that God is with us in the middle of it. So let's read the text today and see how God encounters Moses and see how, what we can learn from that as well. Our text picks up in Exodus 4, right where Pastor Ted left off last week, as God is speaking to Moses from the burning bush and giving him his assignment to go and share what God has told him with the leaders of Israel and then eventually to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So let's read the text together. Exodus 4, chapters 1 Exodus 4, verses 1 through 17. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. 
But if, they, but if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. (laughs) Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak for the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the signs with it. This is God's word. So as we look at God's interactions with Moses and how we can see ourselves into this story and see the doubt in our lives and what God is doing to move us from people who doubt to people to trust him, I think three things really stand out and are worthwhile exploring in this interaction with Moses. First, the direction of our doubt. What's our doubt? What is our doubt really all about? Second, God's response to our doubt. How does God really respond to the doubt that you and I have? And third, God's provision for our doubt. We can see how God actually provides for us even when we're doubting. So let's take some time to look at the direction of our doubt. So we have Moses here speaking directly with God. God is telling him exactly what to do. Have you ever prayed the prayer, God, please tell me exactly what to do? I think apart from praying for my family and for just our life situation and the church and you all, I don't think there's ever been a prayer that I've uttered more than, God, please tell me exactly what to do. And I bet that you all have prayed that as well many times throughout your life. And when I pray that prayer, I tell myself, if you tell me, God, I will have no doubt and I will do exactly what you want me to do. And you probably say the same thing. But is that true? We'd like to think so, but Moses' answer tells us differently. Moses answers God. He says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? And I think in Moses' answer, it reveals the nature of our doubt. Our doubt tends to be all about the what ifs. God speaks. Moses answers and says, sure, I got this. Let's go. Nope. Moses answers God with the two words that summarize the concept of doubt perfectly, what if? And when we look at those words, when we think about what if, don't they tend to be negative? Our what ifs usually lean towards the negative. Just like Moses responds, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? Don't our what ifs lean towards the negative as well? What if I make the wrong decision? Not, what if I make the right decision? What if God is mad at me because I don't read my Bible enough? Not if, not what if God's okay with where I am, and of course he wants me to grow in my relationship with him. What if I permanently mess up my kids because of this homeschool slash hybrid option of going back and forth to school? What if I do that? We don't really think, what if this time with my kids is a gift that maybe God's doing something in it to grow our relationship closer to each other? What if I tell someone my struggles and they view me as weak. Not, what if I let someone in on the struggles in my life, and it's the most powerful thing I can do that will help me grow? See, our our what-ifs tend to be negative. Second, what we can see about the direction of our doubts is not only do our doubting what-ifs tend to be negative, they're usually directed towards other people. Look at Moses' answer again. When he answers, he says, what if they? What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. Now, from the context of the passage and the scriptures around this passage, we know that the they is the leaders of Israel who Moses is going to go and report back to, and eventually it's going to be to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt himself. That, that's their they. But at his core, when God speaks to Moses, just like us, he's worried about what other people are going to think of him, or the, and he's worried about the voices of the other people and the reactions that they're going to have to him 
more than, more, more than he's concerned with what God is saying to him. And when we get, begin to peel back the layers of our doubt, or specifically our doubting of God, and get really concrete with it, if not at all, time, all times, if not at all times, it comes down to a person that we're doubting. And that doubt that we experience is centered around the character and the nature of the person. And many times that's okay because some people, like you know, are worthy of doubt. You know this. People are hard to trust based on their track record with you. The friend who says, I'll be right over and help you, and they never show up. The spouse that says, this will never happen again. And it's the 500th time that they've said that. And trust levels are low. You see, my doubt and your doubt always involves the character and the nature of the person that we're either trusting or doubting. So is the answer simply to trust no one and to live life like that? Of course not. We can't live like that because God created us to be trusting people. But I think what God is trying to tell Moses and what he tells us as we work through our doubt and move to trust is that if our ultimate trust is in people, we're going to be let down. But what God is teaching Moses here, like us, is that we need to be more concerned with trusting the voice, his voice, and not so consumed with the voices around us. James in the New Testament talks about asking God for wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should give you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And what James is telling us here is not doubting in what we're asking for, not saying, I'm going to get wisdom, I'm going to get wisdom, I'm going to get wisdom. He's not saying that, but it's not, it's not about doubting what we're asking for. It's ultimately about doubting the person who we're asking to, doubting the trust in whom, doubting the person in whom we're asking. If we're asking God, he says, go to God and ask God. So it's like asking for wisdom is one thing, but who we're asking is more important. And James says we need to trust God when we ask him those things. And like Moses, we have a choice. We may not be able to trust how others are going to react, but we can trust the voice of God as he leads us. God says, don't worry about them. Trust me, for my character and nature is completely trustworthy. I will never leave you or abandon you. So as we look at the nature of our doubt, the question is to ask ourselves is this, am I doubting other people's response or I'm based on who they are or am I doubting God based on who he is? So as we move from doubting God, to trust in God, it's important to understand that the nature of our what-ifs and to distinguish who we're really doubting. Are we flawed people or are we doubting our perfect God? Which leads to our second point. How does God actually respond to your doubt and to my doubt? The dialogue continues. Moses says, what if they don't? Then the God says to him, what is in your hand? I'm going to kind of paraphrase here. Moses says, it's a staff. God tells him what to do with that staff. He says, throw it down. The staff turns into a snake. And Moses, like us, ran from that staff. You saw a snake. But then he reaches back out and he takes it by the tail. And he turns back into a staff. And then he asks Moses to put his hand into his cloak, pull it back out. It becomes leprous. He puts it back in and it comes back out. And it becomes white as snow. So that's the second sign. And then he says, after that, if they don't believe these first two signs with the, with the staff in your hand, then he says, go to the Nile River, get some water, scoop it up, pour it out, and it will become blood on the ground. So how does God respond to our doubt? Moses is talking to him and telling him, and God asks him a question. Don't you love it when you ask, a, when you ask someone a question and they respond with a question? Moses asks the question, what if? And God answers him with another question. So why do you think God answers Moses' question with another question? I believe that a good, that God does this because it kind of gives us a hint of how God responds to our doubt. God does this. He answers Moses' question with another question simply because a good question keeps the conversation going. And in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of my doubt, in the midst of Moses' doubt, God desires to keep that connection and keep that conversation between us and him going. And so in a weird sort of way, our doubt fuels that, 
and allows us to stay in constant conversation and connection and dialogue with God. Think about this. When you were going through one of the difficult spots in your life, a hard time where you're praying all the time, you're not really sure what the outcome is going to be. It's very difficult. You're saying, God, help me. God, heal me. God, show me what to do. Oftentimes, you're just praying so much, and maybe you left that situation with more questions than answers, but somehow when you look back on your life during those difficult times, it's those times in which you grew the most spiritually. Now, they're not easy, but I think that as we go through times like that, it's not necessarily the questions we're asking or the responses we're getting from God, but it's the source and the the fact that because our life is turned upside down, we are in constant conversation and dialogue with God, and that's what he desires from us. And that allows us to grow spiritually, even in the midst of difficult situations. You see, a simple answer often ends conversation, but a great question continues the conversation. And God wants to be in conversation and relationship with you and me in the middle of our doubts. See, our doubt can actually be a catalyst for conversation with God. God responds to our doubt by continuing to engage us, not push us away, but he continues to engage us. The second part of this is, and even better, I think, so God, God, Moses responds, God responds, Moses asks God, what if they don't listen? And then look at what God says to Moses. Moses. God says, what is in your hand? I love that. Moses is up here in his head, and he's doubting the uncertain and unknown future, what could happen, and God brings it right back to the here and now, It makes it very concrete. Don't we do that? Have you ever had a conversation with someone that you were worried about or worried about the outcome of something that never actually turned out? We lose sleep over this. Our minds race, and we worry about these things that actually never happen. God responds to Moses' doubt by guiding him away from the what-ifs to the very real and tactile present of what is. He says, what is in your hand? God says, I have given you all the resources and the ability and the tools that you need to handle your doubt right here and right now, and it is literally in the palm of your hand. I love how tactile it is. These actions that God tells Moses to do, he says, throw the staff, reach out, take it, put your hand into your cloak, pull your hand out of your cloak, take water from the Nile, pour it out. Doubt is so often up here in our minds and in our heads and it's out there kind of floating around. And God responds to our doubt by simply saying, get present with me in the here and now. Here's the point. A staff, a hand, and some river water aren't really that impressive on their own. But the normal everyday items and gifts that God has placed in your hands when submitted to God can be used in absolutely extraordinary ways, all with the goal of helping you and I to trust him more. Those signs that God gave Moses were just as much about Moses' faith as they were about to show the leaders and the Pharaoh of Egypt that God was with Moses. So the question is, when you're doubting God and when I'm doubting God, instead of looking for the massive big miracle to swoop in and change everything about us, why don't we take time to identify and look at the normal everyday items and gifts that God has given us that he may be able to use extraordinary, do use in extraordinary ways with the ultimate goal of helping us to trust him more. What are your gifts? What are your training? What is your resources as you doubt God? What do you have with you? I'm sure most of you don't have staffs. At the first service, there's a few. <laughs> but... I know that you all have talents and gifts from God that he could use in you to stretch you and to grow you and to help others to trust in him. That's why I love our community garden team. It's just a bunch of people that, love, that, that have a love for like gardening. This is nothing crazy special, but there's like a tomato guy. There's like a pepper guy. And all they've done is really just taken that love that they have for those things and submitted them to God and, and, and it's helping this garden and this community to grow and to blossom into something awesome. They just submitted the normal everyday gifts that they've had, and they use it 
in extraordinary ways, and it helps their faith, it helps my faith, and it helps the faith of the whole community because they took what they had and just submitted it before God, and he's doing great things through it. Maybe it's financially that you can, maybe it's your finances that you can submit to God, and he's asking you to put your hand into your cloak and to submit and to bring it back out and to submit that in your life. We have friends down in North Carolina who are a little bit older and they can't really do all the volunteer and the heavy lifting and, and work that lots of people do, but financially they support everything. And God has done extraordinary things through them just simply by, because they submitted what they've been given and they've given it back to God. And those people trust God more than any people that I know because they've submitted their lives, they submitted their gifting back to God. And it just happens to be in the area of finances. Maybe God's asking you to scoop up some of your time and pour it out into relationships of reconciliation, joining a Be the Bridge group, or joining a group that helps foster racial reconciliation within the church and within our communities. You see, when you doubt, instead of being up here and out there, take some time to listen and reflect on what it is that God has already given you and entrust it back to God. Maybe you're great at sports and you're not really sure about God, but you can trust God that he's working through you in sports and you can do that to help other people. Maybe it's teaching or academics. Maybe you're really smart and you can mentor people and help them along in their faith and submit that gifting that you have and trust that God is going to work in that process. Maybe you're an artist and you can create and, and, and make things that reflect the goodness and glory of God all in the means, all the while God is bolstering and moving you from a person of doubt to trust. See, when we take the normal everyday gifts and items that God has given us and submit them back to him, watching him work in amazing ways, our doubt begins to turn to trust. Finally, let's look at the last point, which is God's provision for our doubt. God's provision for our doubt. So Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave humans their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. It's interesting, at this point, Moses is done asking questions. He just says, tells God, I'm out. He says, I'm out. But does God banish him? Absolutely not. not in his, he doesn't banish him in his doubt. He answers him with four more questions. The conversation continues. But in Moses' statement of, of doubt back to God, there's something that, that shows how God provides for us even in our doubt. God essentially says to Moses, who created all of this around you? Who created you, Moses, the way that you are? That's no accident, even if you do have limited abilities. That's up to me. God says, I did this, and I who made you, and here's the point. He says, I will help you and teach you. See, in the midst of our doubt, God doesn't abandon us but he decides to come alongside and help us and teaches us. You see, as you walk through your doubt, you're never, ever really alone. Even if you haven't left your house in a really long time, for whatever reasons, you are never alone. God never leaves us or abandons us, even in your darkest times of doubting him. He wants to help you and to teach you. These last couple of months, I've had the pleasure of coaching an eight and under baseball team. And it was really cool. And it's really fun, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so as we're doing this, I love base I used to play baseball. I love baseball. And um, there was kids there that really wanted to learn baseball, and I would love to try and help and teach them. And some other kids, just because of where they were at, nothing wrong. They just weren't interested. They were more interested in like stuff growing in the outfield or birds flying over their head. So that's, that was hard because I'm like, I wanted everyone to love baseball. But here's the point: is like. Those kids, I felt no greater honor, and I, and I loved when they came and said, Coach, like, what do I do? Because it was at that point that they submitted themselves and postured themselves in a place where I could actually help and teach them. And as a coach, I loved doing that. The other kids, I couldn't, I couldn't help as much because they didn't submit themselves and posture themselves in a position where I could actually do that. And I think it's the same way with God. He loves to help us and teach us, just like he tells Moses. And he does that for us in the middle of our doubt. We just have to posture ourselves and get ourselves into position to hear and to allow him to do that. We have it better than Moses. 
You know, in the Old Testament, in, in passages like this, the Holy Spirit, God would come and he would speak to Moses and he would withdraw his presence. But now in the New Testament, after Christ and what Christ has done for us, the Holy Spirit now lives with us, helping us and teaching us 24-7 every day of the year. We have it better because the Holy Spirit is in us and we are never alone. And God is constantly available to help and teach us through his Holy Spirit. As the conversation continues in Moses' boldest statement yet, he finally flat out says, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. And what does God do? He gets angry, but he also says, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. Then he says this, I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. You see, in the midst of your doubt, God provides for us by bringing other people around us as well. So when you're walking through a season of doubt and not sure what God is doing or what's happening around you, who has God placed in your life that you can humbly ask to walk alongside you? Who are the people God has placed around you in your community that can walk with you in this season of doubt? You can reach out to them. See how God provides someone for you to lean on, just like he did Aaron for Moses. God provides for you, and you're never alone. You have the Holy Spirit in you, and God brings people around you in your community, even in the midst of your doubt. One of the favorite things I like about that last verse says this. It says, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? He says, God says, I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. And what's that next part say? It says, and he will be glad to see you. How many times in the midst of a difficult season of life have you failed to reach out to someone because you're nervous that they're not going to be glad to see you or that you're going to be a burden to that person? I know in going through difficult times, I have a friend I text. I'm like, I'm just not going to text him today because I don't want to be that guy again. I think God put this in here, talking about Aaron being glad to see him. Because when God brings people around you to help you walk in your doubt, they're going to be glad to see you. They want to help you. God has placed them there. That's no accident. And when you reach out to them, don't feel like you're being a burden. But they're going to be glad to see you and glad to hear from you and glad to walk alongside you. Because someday you're going to walk alongside them when they go through a season of doubt. The application of all this is really, really simple. If God is asking you to do something, do it. Let's pray. No. If God is asking you to do something, whatever it may be, and the Holy Spirit is confirming that, and you have people around you asking, you know, confirming what God is doing in your life, if he's asking you to do something, do it. It is about the process of God moving you from here to there that's going to help you grow, maybe even more than it is the thing that you're actually going to be doing. God cares about us enough to move us from people who doubt him to people who trust him, and he walks with us through every step of that journey. God is for you, and he wants you to be people, and he wants me to be a person who trusts him more. Would you stand as we close in prayer? God does not reject you in your doubt, nor does he shy away from you in your doubt. But he walks alongside you, and he, and he brings people, and he gives you resources to help you to trust him more, whatever it is he may be calling you do, to do, just like he does with Moses. God, we thank you that you don't abandon us when we don't trust. We thank you that you know us enough and care for us enough and want us to be in relationship with you no matter what we're doing, whether that's doubting or trusting, you care about our relationship with you. God, thank you that you provide for us in our doubt, whether that's through your Holy Spirit or the people around us. God, you are so good to us. You know us inside and out. And your ultimate goal for us is to be people who move from doubting you to trusting you. God, I pray that we can do that this week. I pray for everyone here that we would just move closer in our relationship with you and to trust who you are and how you are because of your great goodness and mercy to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday.